Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, a weekly show, which is called Things We Said Today, where we explore what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you might know another program that I host on the Beatles, syndicated around the country and globally, since it started on the internet. The show is called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner. Mr. Steve Marinucci. Hi, you Steve. forgot to say the Weird Al Yankovic examiner. That's important. Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm telling you, this, we're really building with this Weird Al thing. Yes, we are. We are. And actually, <laughs> it's a funny thing because right before I came to the studio to do this show with you, I saw the news today, oh boy, about the George Harrison tribute concert mm-hmm. happening in L.A. And who's one of the performers? Weird Al. That's right. And I'm dying to find out what song he's going to do. Wow. I mean, that's that would be, uh, assuming he's going to do a song. I mean, that's uh, uh, that's amazing. I'd, I'm going to have to see if I can find that out. Well, so. it's kind of ironic that ever since you started doing the Examiner column on Weird Al, his album becomes number one. Well, actually, it happened after, I believe it happened after the album became number one. Okay. Well, right please. after. Go with but, it, Steve. <laughs> oh, all right, go with it. But I mean, it's been it, you know he's really he's really off. I mean, he's really it, his career definitely has has gone to a new level, which I'm I'm personally glad about because I I do like him I do like his music a lot. Yeah, he is great at what he does. Mm-hmm. And uh, so here he is. He's one of the headliners. Yes. For this, for this tribute for George. Yes, he is. So that's and that's a that's going to be really. Uh, Really cool, uh, and I mean, and there's no, you know, there's some good people on that show. Brian Wilson is on it. Mm-hmm. Um, Nora Jones, who incidentally has a connection to George in other ways because she's uh, Ravi Shankar's daughter. Right. And Wilson of Heart is going to be on there. There's a whole bunch of people on there. Um, this going to be a great show. And what's really interesting for people who live in Southern California. It's the same night and time as Paul McCartney's show in San Diego. Mm. So, wasn't timed well. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. At least it's not in San Diego. It's in Los Angeles. So, I mean, there is a bit of a distance there. But I've so, already heard from a couple of people saying if Paul wasn't in San Diego, they'd be going to this. Mm. So, well, what know. what Paul should do if this is a long concert, mm-hmm. this George should be a thing. When Paul's done with his concert, take a flight, you know, go over to L.A. and then you know join in at the end. Sure, that would be that would be interesting to see mm-hmm. him do that. That would definitely be interesting. And I'm sure, I mean, he's done that type of thing before with Billy Joel. That's right. Last we better minute. We, we better <laughs> make sure to let everybody know we're just kind of joking here. You know, don't get any ideas. It's not going to happen. Well, we hope it's. I mean, we we sure would love to, but I mean. It's I, unlikely. I, I really doubt Paul will show up in L.A., but, boy, that would be fun if he did. Hmm. Okay, well, before Surprise we... Surprise the heck out of everybody, that's for sure. Go ahead. Before we get started with the show, um, we should note that this is a milestone for us. This where's is, the trumpets? Where's the, where's the uh, fanfare? Uh, we couldn't afford it with our no. budget. Uh, this is our 100th show. Yay! Yay. We actually survived. <laughs> I know. So we, yeah, I mean we we've lasted, we've made it, we've made it. Mm-hmm. So well, cool, and thank you, thank you, Ken, for you know all the work that you've done with this. He's behind, he's the Mister behind the scenes as far as the show goes. Uh, you know, uh, everybody thinks that uh, you know that uh, we just put it up and there it is. But no, Ken does the editing. Ken Ken handles all the technical stuff. And I'm the least technical person on the planet, too. <laughs> and and uh, so, anyway, but thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to thank you, Steve, for for these 100 shows and adding your insight, and um, it's been fun. And it has, and I'm really glad that we got to finally actually meet each other. That was great. Actually, uh, it, it, it's kind of, <laughs> I've been thinking, wouldn't it be funny if this show became a really big show and we never met each other? I know. <laughs> that would have been sad, but I'm glad we did. Yes. So then when we get real big, we can say we did meet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so before we talk about 
the hundred shows that we've done, we're going to be we're going to be discussing what we feel are either the best or our favorites, and we'll do that later on in the show. But the major news item here, aside from the George Harrison tribute concert, concerns George because it has now been made official about this George Harrison box set mm-hmm. called The Apple Years, and it is what we thought it was. It's actually um, six titles, although it's seven CDs. Um, Wonderwall music is there. It's the, that was the first of George's solo albums. Uh, followed by Electronic Sound, then All Things Must Pass, which counts as two CDs, uh, Living in the Material World, Dark Horse, and Extra Texture. So we've got six titles spread out over seven CDs, and there's also a DVD included. So we right. do have information about what will be on the box set, so why don't we bring that up? You know, I've seen some comments uh, when the uh, announcement was made, after the announcement was made, and people... Some people said this really was uh, it was not a big, you know, as exciting as it could have been or as it should be. I guess because of uh, electronic sound and and um, Wonderwall music, I suppose if you're if you really like that stuff. I mean, I never those are two albums I never listened to, and so it's, it's interesting that you know that uh, I, you know I don't know how much how much of an interest I have in, in listening to those CDs. Um, mm-hmm. I, I will say that Wonderwall Music is going to have In the First Place, which is a, which is a great song which George sings on. But um, All right, well, first of all, let's clarify here. In the First Place is by the Liverpool band called the Remo Four. Right. And what more do we know about this song? Well, he's, I mean, he's on it, and... Um, I mean, it's a good song. It's a you know, it's a period song. It's a it's from the period, and it sounds kind of, you know somewhat psychedelic and everything. And, and you know, and um, it wasn't included, as I recall, and I'm trying to remember for sure. I don't think it was in the original version. It was on the recent DVD because they added it as an extra, mm-hmm. and it was actually part of the. Now that I think about it, it was part of the director's cut of the of the movie. Which, by the way, was one. That was one strange movie. Mm-hmm. One very strange movie. Um, I will say, I've seen Wonderwall the film several times, and it's it's for me anyway a difficult film to watch all the way through. Very mm-hmm. interesting, very psychedelic, but I do love the music. I mean, I've always enjoyed the album, unlike mm-hmm. you, because I find George and the music that he writes, that's Indian music, what he's composed for that, to be fascinating. Just the fact that. Certainly at a very young age, he was so heavily into that and was able to compose this music in the first place, aside from the stuff that he wrote with the Beatles, with Indian instruments. Right. So to have all that and a few rock tracks to throw in there as well, yes, you can say it's soundtrack music, but it's still George with a, with a side project that he spent some time with there, and um, I do find it fascinating to hear the instrumental stuff that he was writing at that time. Mm-hmm. The film is a difficult watch for me, but I do love the music. Yeah, I, I mean, I when the DVD came out, I tried to to watch it, and yeah, it's hard. It's definitely hard to sit through. Mm-hmm. The plot is not, uh, you know, what little plot there is is strange. Let's put it that way. But in any event, I mean, he's all George is all over it, and it's it, it it's basically a product of the times, is what it is. So, all right. Um, there's also an alternate take of the inner light. On there, mm-hmm. I'm not That's... sure what they mean by that exactly because to me, I'm thinking that uh, I know that it's been bootlegged, the backing tracks of the Inner Light without the vocals. I'm right. thinking that's probably what that is, because those tracks were recorded at EMI Studios in Bombay at that time when he was doing right. the, the music for Wonderwall, and uh, so that's that's probably what that is. I'm not totally sure, but that's what I'm thinking. And then the uh, the other song on on the uh, CD, the other bonus track is is called Almost Shankara, which wasn't used in the film. Somebody posted yesterday that Peter Tork is asking if any of the tracks that he was on, because he apparently was on the soundtrack, um, are included. And in I honestly can't. I honestly don't know. Um, I wonder if that that unheard song, the unreleased song, is something that he's on. Yeah, Peter was supposed to play banjo. Right. And uh, unless 
we can get some word from the Harrison family, mm -hmm. Danny or Olivia, we really can't say for sure. Right. right. But, um, you know, I'm glad that you do have these three bonus tracks on there to make it a little bit more worthwhile. Mm -hmm. The music is, yeah, you're right about the music. It's actually, again, it's, you know, just just to hear that stuff again from back then, it's, it's, it's kind of cool, you know. I mean, that's because of what it was. Well, I don't look at this music as being period music. Oh, really? really? No, not at all. Especially Indian music, if I can listen to Love You Too, <laughs> or Within You, Without You, or The Inner Light, I can listen to this other music. <laughs> and the thing about George's stuff is that a lot of Indian music, like classical music, they're long pieces. What George does, he, he, they're really much shorter pieces of music. So it's easier to digest. Wonderwall like, also had a lot of psychedelic elements to it. You know the the movie and the soundtrack, so that's why I'm saying I think it's more like period music. I mean, as as opposed to something like Ravi Shankar, which really, which was never that way. Which, if you listen to, you know, early Ravi Shankar as opposed to later, it all there's there's really no distinction for me um, in listening to his stuff because I have quite a few of his albums. I really like listening to him. Mm -hmm. So, But this stuff does sound a little more dated, I think, than, than stuff like Ravi Shankar does. But, okay, well, that's your opinion, and I respect it. I don't agree with it, but... Okay. You know. uh, we move on to Electronic Sound, which was George dabbling in synthesizer music, new for its time. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I rarely listen to, I will admit. You know, mm -hmm. it takes a long time. It's nothing that sticks in your mind. It's not, there's no element of commerciality to it, which doesn't mean it doesn't have its purpose. But, you know, as as something that George was into at the moment, it's it's a part of his history. So I'm glad that it's out there. The, the thing about the new version or the, the new release is that they've reversed the, the sides from the American. Apparently somebody mixed up the sides for the American disc. Hmm. And they figured out that the UK disc is the correct one. So that's the one that they're going with here. Okay. So both sides, each one was one long piece of music. So right. side two was really the first cut on the CD. Right. Okay. Um, All Things Must Pass is the exact same packaging as what appeared in the remaster from 2001. By the way, we should mention that all of these CDs that were remastered before or remastered again. Mm -hmm. That's from what I've been reading. Because the, the big plus here in this whole package is that Dark Horse and Extra Texture are in the mix, and though this is the first time that those two titles have been remastered. Right. But for the other ones, they're being remastered again. We, that's, what we, that's kind of what we, we're being led to believe. I'm not, po I'm not positive about that. That's, I mean, we've heard things like that before where they haven't done that, but I'm guessing if there are added tracks, they've probably done some work on them, you know, to, for the whole, for the new configuration, so. Okay. Well, I loved all the bonus material that was on the remaster, and um, this one has the same ones. Mm -hmm. Especially I Live For You, which is a gem of a song that should have been on the original album when right. it first came out. But it's great to have all the alternate takes of songs. Let It Down is on there. Really wonderful to hear. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad that they kept the same bonus tracks as uh, as the original. Right. Um, Living in the Material World has the same bonus tracks that was on the remaster with Miss Odell. Uh, that was the flip side of Give Me Love and Deep Blue, the flip side of Bangladesh. But they're also adding the remixed Bangladesh, the single version. Mm-hmm which came out a few years ago on iTunes, just the one song. Right. So, um, yeah, so those are the bonus cuts on Living in the Material World. Dark Horse has the bonus track of I Don't Care Anymore, which was the B-side of the single for Dark Horse. And there's also an early unreleased take for Dark Horse. Mm. And so that'll be on there. And um, Extra Texture has as a bonus track the 1992 version of This Guitar Can't Keep From Crying, which was recorded as a demo for Dave Stewart. And then it does say 
because I didn't really know this information until it was posted and, and you included it in your article in Beatles Examiner. There were overdubs done 10 years later for that right. version. Yeah, that, I thought that was interesting, too. I'm, surpri- I'm actually kind of surprised that they're using the updated version, but with a, and with an added vocalist. That's that's the kicker there. Um, but we'll we'll see how that works out when when the time comes. Right. Well, the overdubs had um, Ringo on drums. Right. And also Danny was playing guitar on there, and uh, vocals Caro Diagardi on vocals. I'm not sure if this is the version that I've heard, or if it is updated. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can find on YouTube there were uh, the rehearsals for this with George talking to Dave Stewart in the right. studio. Real interesting stuff. Yes, uh, that is that is interesting. By the way, that, that reminds me that Danny will be involved in the. I didn't men- we didn't mention Danny's name when we were talking about the Harrison tribute. He is is involved in that. He will be there. Yeah, that's so great. that's that's a good thing too. Mm-hmm. So anyway, and uh, also there is a DVD included. Right. And um, there's more than 40 minutes of material on there. The most interesting from all that I've seen here is a seven-minute piece, which is new, called George Harrison, The Apple Years Feature. It's directed by Olivia Harrison. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that is a new feature. There's also a bonus feature from the All Things Must Pass package. I don't know which one it is. Um, something from the EPK for the concert for Bangladesh, which, oddly enough, I don't know why, maybe they wanted to keep it to studio albums, but the concert for Bangladesh, the album itself, the CDs are not part of this package. Yeah, I, I, I felt the same way. I don't know why that why that is. But. Hmm. And there's also the video of Give Me Love from Live in Japan. Um, that was in the remaster for Living in a Material World. Actually, the, the, this other material, the bonus material on the DVD, was from that remaster mm-hmm. for Living in a Material World. There's the alternate version of Miss O'Dell and an early version of Sumi Suyu Blues. Plus, there's also the videos for Ding Dong Ding Dong and Dark Horse, and that'll be on the, the DVD as well. Right. So, okay. um, so what else do we know about this? Well, pretty. I mean, pretty much that's it. I mean, they have put up a couple of trailers um, that, are, that are on YouTube that are interesting to see. There really isn't much else to say. I mean, I wish there was more reason to get it beyond the two remastered albums and the DVD. Hmm. Uh, oh, there is also, by the way, a hardback book. Um, we didn't mention that. Right. Which is not surprising. Um, yeah, I really wish there was more reason to to get this beyond the two albums, and I think a lot of people will probably pass on it and just buy the two albums. Possibly, yeah. But then they can't get the DVD. Right. You can only get the DVD with the box set. And, and the book. Right, right. And the book has an introduction by Danny. Right. And there's also new essays written by Kevin Howlett. And uh, there's also rare and previously unpublished images in the mm-hmm. book. Yeah, so, there's a um, lot of there's going to be some interesting stuff there. So it, it it'll be it'll be a nice set, you know, for what it is. Um, a nice uh, collection for the holidays is really what it is. Mm. So. Well, I'm I'm happy that this is being done, although, like you just said, I wish there was a lot more bonus material. And the one thing that, that disappoints me most of all is that so much of what's bonus material is what was on the remastered CDs in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I just wish that there was a lot more of that. But this is mainly, you're buying this for the Sonic upgrade. And uh, as long as, you know, the entire catalog of George and, and all the solo Beatles stuff remains in print, I'm happy about that. So, right. But it just seems like when I see something like this, it makes me think about the unreleased music from George in his solo career, and probably, I'm guessing, what we got a taste of with Early Takes Volume 1 a couple of years ago, that's probably how the unreleased stuff from George is going to come out, in that format, instead of... And it, yeah, it looks like it's going to come out in, in bits and pieces, which is really a shame. They're going to basically just put out a little bit here and a little bit there, and I think that's kind of unfair. I think we're getting to the point, especially with a lot of Beatle fans getting older, that they want to hear a lot more of this stuff while they're still around. Hmm. And it's beginning to look like that's not going to happen so much. Well, we'll see. 
I mean, the the one thing that stuck out for me, and you know, and we talked about this box set before, when I saw there was a DVD included, and I'm thinking, there's got to be something from the Dark Horse tour from 74, mm-hmm. and there may be something in there, but I want a full concert from that tour. And yeah. what I've said about George, and especially John, there are so few live performances from them in their solo careers that everything that they've done, you have to regard as being precious. So even though... George was criticized heavily during that tour for having a hoarse voice, and uh, I know that he didn't react too well from that, to the point where he didn't continue touring again until he toured in Japan with Eric Clapton. Yeah, I... And so any of that material of him doing a full concert, we still haven't gotten a live in Japan full concert, legitimate. And it makes you wonder, why can't we get just one full... Regardless of whether or not... George's voice was in the best of shape or not. It's still historically so important because it was the only time he did a full tour, his only North American tour, and there should be something on that. And you would also think, and I don't know how much thought is put into this because we're such an anniversary-driven culture, it is 40 years this year since the Dark Horse tour. So you would think, well, now you're putting out the Dark Horse CD remastered, what would be the perfect companion to that? Put out one full concert. Right. Um, so that's what I was waiting for most of all, aside from Dark Horse and Extra Texture on, uh, remastered on CD. Yep. So, um, yeah, but I'm certainly glad to see George's name out there and the fact that it's being remastered. And any sonic improvement I'm for. So um, that's basically all that I have to say about that. Yeah, I, I mean, we're getting, like I said, I mean, with, with Paul, we were talking about with Paul's, with the... Uh, the remasters with, the remasters, with his remasters, which, by the way, have been pushed back to November. Um, and some people, by the way, have speculated that it's because of this, because of the Harrison box. It's possible. I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, if you think about it, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I used to always think that way. And then there have been times in recent years when two Beatles have released something at the same time. Or Paul and Ringo touring at the same time. Right. Well... They, if that was the case, they wouldn't have had anything in September at all because of the the mono vinyl box, and I don't know. Um, and I've been told by my sources that it is definitely production problems, okay. quote unquote. Hmm. So you can take that to wherever it is. Um, I mean, we can kind of guess, you know, all we want to, but that's what they're saying. So I don't know, but. I really wish they were a little more, a little more looser with the open open up the vaults a little more. Um, I still, even though she hasn't done it for a while, Yoko was was very good about that. And the only thing now that's missing, the only thing that we really need to get is that Madison Square Garden concert, you know, remastered. Why we don't have that, I don't know. But that really needs to come out again, and hopefully. That will come out maybe next year. Well, we have heard about that, and you know about that because Jack Douglas was was asked to work on that. Mm-hmm. The but they still work. haven't put it. They haven't still put a, a date on it yet. I'll just bet it's next year. I, I I would hope so. I would very much hope so. Yoko always puts out something around the time of John's birthday. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm figuring for next well, year. Well, I hope I hope you're right. I mean, it it should have come out before this. Why why they've been dragging their feet on that one? But then why have they been dragging their feet on so many other things, for that matter? Hmm. You know, so. Well, know. it could just be, and I know that you'll disagree with this, as will many Beatle fans, that you stretch these things out over a long period of time so that there's always news, and it keeps the Beatles in the news, and them in, individually. Well, yeah, yeah, but you also have a lot of technological boosts coming every few years, too, so that even if you put out something it's not to say you can't put it in a new package and you know upgrade the sound somewhat or do something upgrade the color i mean there's all sorts of examples of that um the one thing i'm uh the one thing i'm thinking of um just off the top of my head is the uh the who's isla white show that they released and then re reissued in a different cover and i think the the sound was upgraded for that Mm-hmm. Uh, or another track was added or something. I can't remember which one. But, I mean, that's a case where 
the two releases were fairly close together. And so, yeah, I mean, they don't have to be as stingy about this as they are. It's just it's just not necessary. Mm-hmm. So. Well, like I said, I do think that with George's unreleased stuff, it's probably going to come out over the early takes series, probably. I hope so. I hope uh, I hope we can get to hear that second one pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's just talk about our 100 shows here. Oh, my. <laughs> That's right. And mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of hard for me to believe that it is 100. I know. It, time went by. Time went by so quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you want to run down your... You want, you want to do one at a time and talk about favorite shows? Well, do that? what I did was I just went to Podbean. Mm-hmm. And I scrolled down and looked at all the shows that we'd done, and there's so many that I even forgot about. Mm. And uh, I just can't believe all the people we've interviewed in two years. I know, I know. <laughs> and just in general, I, I think the best shows that we've done are the interview shows. Oh, sure, Ob- obviously. And, and I mean, those yeah. were my, those were the. Uh, I, I made one exception to that with the Candlestick show because it was personal. Um, you know that we we both saw it together. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the interview shows were great. I think my the 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 one interview show that sticks out in my mind is the believe it or not the Rusty Anderson show because wow. we were able to snag Rusty between tour between tours and I thought that was that was fantastic and he was he was very you know talkative and he talked about the sh- about the tour and talked about his record of course and and I thought I really enjoyed that I. That was really that really was a nice show. I I loved that a lot. Yeah, uh, I would like to really interview all the members of the band because they yes. all have their own story to tell and and yes. their own angle on right. things. That's that's a, that's one of our goals. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say, mm-hmm. I mean, and, and really and truly, it's unfair to me to pick one because um, sometimes I just think of the one with Chuck Gunderson as being one that was really outstanding. Because his book, for one thing, it's one of the best books that have come out in the last couple of years, along with the obvious Mark Lewison. Uh, But so much of what he put into that book, Some Fun Tonight, which was all about the U.S. tours of the Beatles, it's as complete a book as you could ever possibly imagine. All the factual information about every single show they did. Yep. Oh, yeah, there's no question. That's, That's a reference book for the ages. And it certainly seems like Chuck has all this information stored in his brain. <laughs> he right. just remembers so much, every detail, the hotels yes. the Beatles stayed at, yes. how much money was made on each show, how much it cost for security on each show. You know, every little detail. It's just amazing what he can come up with. And I loved having that little debate at the end of the show where I was bringing up how it's hard for me to believe that the Beatles didn't sell out several shows in 1966 in America. Just the fact that, you know, I confronted him on that. I know that it's true, but it's just still very hard for me to grasp that idea mm-hmm. when you consider the fact that they were still the biggest band in the world. Their records were still selling as best as, as they could. I mean, if you take a look at 1966, Revolver hit number one as an album here in the States. Uh, the Yesterday and Today album hit number one. They had a number one single with Paperback Writer. Right. You know, they had a number two hit with Yellow Submarine. They had all this success going on. Their sales were not really slowing down. And yet, somehow, the sales of their shows were impacted by the the whole controversy of, over the, the Beatles being bigger than Jesus. And I right. even remember saying that, you know, I could see in the Bible Belt being affected, but not on the East Coast. Well, you know, as, I still, as, I, as I seem to remember saying at the time, it was a different time and place. It wasn't, a, you know, in a Facebook-driven society like we have now, that would never have happened. But back in 66, things were incredibly different. Mm. So, But still, the Beatles were the number one band in the world then. That yeah. didn't change. No, that didn't change. But their stature, their stature uh, as buzzwords, or uh, if I could say it that way, their stature was not the same as it is now. It really isn't because, you know, the establishment still ran the show. If you get what I'm, what I'm saying there. Uh huh. Things uh, again, you know, these uh, the adults still had the keys to the, to the to the playroom. The, the kids don't didn't like they do now. Mm-hmm. So that's where that's where that all came in. That's where where that was. 
And also one thing that Chuck brought up, which I hadn't really thought about, was that whereas in 1964, Brian Epstein was so careful about booking the Beatles at places where he knew they would sell out, mm -hmm. smaller venues, where, where you knew there was no chance of there being uh, you know, any empty seats. In 65, they took the big risk of being booked at stadiums, and then in 66, they booked even bigger venues. So it's understandable how in some of them they wouldn't have sold out for that reason, apart from the whole controversy. Right. But, um, no, he was a great guest, and I'd love to, you know, have him on again. Yes. That Candlestick Park, I mean, is a good example of, of a big stadium. I mean, that's a, you know, it's not the, a huge, huge stadium, but it was a, it was a big place. Mm -hmm. so. Right. And also, I just wrote down, and this, there's so many of them, some really good interviews on the show. I liked having Alan Cozen on a couple mm -hmm, times. I agree. Especially when we were talking about the whole legalities behind the bootleg recordings of what came out yeah, in 1963. Yeah, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, Robert Rodriguez, although the interview with him was kind of cut short because I think it started late and I had to do my live program. Mm -hmm. So uh, We'll you know, have to have him back on again. Right. Uh, Dave Morell, who was just on before, the stories he could tell from being yeah, in the music that on, industry. Yeah, that was on my list too. Yeah. I especially love, apart from the whole story of how he came to meet John Lennon. The whole bit about meeting Paul McCartney when the Press to Play album came out and talking mm -hmm. about what then was the proposed Sessions album and going through a few of the songs and what Paul had to say about it to him. Mm -hmm. How cool is that to have a conversation like that? True. Surprisingly, Melissa Davis. Mm, um, she, okay. She's the co-author of the Beatles bibliography right. and also the first supplement. And we were talking about what are the best Beatle books or the most recent ones. And she had a lot to say. Yeah, so um, that, I, enjoy, I enjoyed that too. I didn't put that wasn't on my list, but yeah, that was a good that was a good show. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple more. Um, the Dave Humphrey show, right after Tony Sheridan's passing. Okay, that was very emotional um, for Dave, definitely. Sure, there, but it was, was emotional for I think it was emotional for all of us um, trying to talk about Tony Sheridan then, and uh, so that was, a, that was a good show. And for anyone that doesn't know, Dave Humphreys is a musician that lives in San Diego, and he, he's put together the San Diego Beatle conventions the last few years, and he's, he was good friends with Tony Sheridan and recorded with him and performed live with him. So, you know, he took Tony's death very hard. Yeah, he and, did. And uh, it showed it in the program. Yeah, in fact, it was within a week, I think, of, of Tony's death. That he, he did the show as, as a real big favor to us, and uh, we'd like to th I'd like to thank him again for doing that. That was a great show. Mm -hmm. The Peter Asher show when when we were in Oakland, when I was in the in the next room, and Peter was in the next room from him, and and uh, we did that kind of live taping thing. Um, that was that was fun. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed that. Um, the Chris Carter show, where we talked about train music, I really enjoyed that. And bo and the shows with Mark Lapidus were really fun um, to hear him go on about the um, the history of the fest and tell us a few things that, that I'd never heard. Um, when you, when you think about forty years of doing the fest, which is mm -hmm. extraordinary, imagine all the stories that he could tell. And I would really love to to have a more in depth interview with him, especially right. about all the guests that he's had through the years, many of whom are no longer with us. Right. One other show yeah. that I forgot to put on my well, two other shows. One I put on my list was the Kevin Hollett show. Mm -hmm. One I forgot to put on my list that I meant to was the Frida Kelly interview from Liverpool. Right. That. Was that's probably up near the top, very top of the list. That was so much fun to talk to her because she is such a wonderful, wonderful person, and um, I really, really loved having her on the show. I loved meeting her. I'm looking forward to. I guess she's going to be in L.A. I'm looking forward to seeing her in L.A. for Beetle Fest again, and uh, that was a great show. Mm -hmm. even, even though we had some major technical difficulties. With that one, right? That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Okay. I also wrote down Al Sussman. You know, okay. Al is always a lot of fun to talk to, and he he actually, you know, it, it's tough when there have been so many Beatle books out there to come up with one with a different angle. And his was more about our culture and how it changed in the hundred days after 
President Kennedy's assassination. Right. So just, you know, looking at it from that point of view, not just the Beatles, but everything else, you know, that was, that was uh, you know, an interesting topic there right. to bring up, an interesting angle. And he's always fun to have as a guest anyway, such an easy conversation to have with him. Right. And um, I also put down Lawrence Juber, who's, uh, he, he's just, he's such an interesting person. He's a wonderful interview. He's he, a he, very easy person to talk to. That's, yeah, exactly. You know, he spent the three years with Paul, and he can say so much about that time, and also as someone who's such a student of music and different styles of music and applying that to Paul McCartney mm-hmm. and what it was like to work with him. You know, what, what he thinks of Paul as a songwriter, as someone who studied so, so many different types of music and has such a deep appreciation for standards, for example. You know, and he his, brings his, all that to the table. And as someone who has played guitar many, 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 many years ago and who would never compare, be able to get even close to what Lawrence is just to watch his technical skill right. on guitar is just astounding. He's fantastic mm-hmm. so. um, I also put down Mark Rivera who's you know so ah, nice there's another one I missed that uh, he was so personable and so he was such a good talker and he was so open about working with Ringo and and, uh, and stuff yeah, that was that was a lot of fun mm-hmm. too. you know he's one of those people it's priceless to have these people who have actually worked as an artist with one of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And in the case of Mark Rivera, you've got, he's, he's been in more all-star bands than anyone outside of Ringo. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, it's invaluable to have someone like that as a guest. Right. Um, David Bedford, I really like his work. Here's someone else who took another angle on the Beatles and put out a book recently, The Fab 104, where he's giving little synopsis, these stories of people who played a small part in Beatle history but an important part in some yeah, way. Yeah, no, that was a good that was a good book. Uh, James A. Mitchell, I enjoyed having on. Yes. Uh, Jim Birkenstadt was a great interview. Mm-hmm. Um, there's somebody that you know you can tell he has a huge passion on the Beatles, but there's another story that hasn't been told. Jimmy, he was just on the Reels channel last night. Um, I haven't checked my DVR. I set it up last night to see it. Um, he was on a show about John Lennon last night. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll have to check my. I haven't checked my DVR today, but uh, I'll have to do that uh, later and see if I if that show came out because uh, I didn't get to see that last night. So right. Also, Bruce Spizer. He's someone who's a great guest to have on because he can talk about so many different topics on the Beatles history in detail. And we just had him on just to talk about the Beatles on VJ. Right. Because his book was released as as an ebook. He could, we could, we, you could have him on, and he would just talk for. We could, we could run a, a you know, an extra long show and never have a problem <laughs> with him because he, he's so knowledgeable. Right. Um, Billy J. Kramer was on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was that was a real thrill to have him on the show. Mm-hmm. That was really a thrill to have him. Um, he has been. I've always loved his music. Always. Um, you know all those all those songs that he all those Beatles songs he did and it, I mean his albums have, have always been great I've always loved them and so well I hope that he he talks a lot more about his history not just with the Beatles but the things he can talk about concerning Brian Epstein mm-hmm. George Martin being a part of the British invasion all of that all I the think, other I think- it seems like he is. I've, the more interviews, the recent interviews I've seen, he, especially Brian Upside. Now that you know Brian Upside is being honored for various things, mm-hmm. he is talking about Brian. Which and is Billy, good. Billy played a big part in that. Right. You know, he recorded that song to Liverpool with Love on his recent album. Right. And um, he was questioning why Brian isn't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and then shortly after that, he was Bingo. inducted. So, uh, you know, kudos to, to Billy for that. But you talk about somebody with a lot of history going back to the 60s. You know, Billy's right up there, the top of the list. Right. As far as shows where we didn't interview people, mm-hmm. um, I did like when we talked about the significance of the film A Hard Day's Night. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a very interesting show. You know, and and how revolutionary that film was for its time, and how people are still using some of uh, the innovation from that film in later work, and, and and still today. And that brings to mind the show we did about Magical Mystery Tour, where 
we di- we disagreed rather significantly. Yes, I thought about the the relevance of the film and you know and its and its significance and I don't know I I think that the you know things have proven out I'm, I'm not going to say I told you so but I think things have proven out that I was right about that that the film really wasn't the big deal that the Beatles made it out to be. So all right, well you know you have your own point of view. Okay. You know, I enjoy watching the film. Maybe not as much as A Hard Day's Night in Help, but, you know, I, I look at it as being innovative for its time and very different and freeform, sure. and some people look at it that way. Yeah, oh, no, I know, and I understand, and that was the reason, that was the, that was what they played on, you know, for the, for the reissue, you know, the... Uh, it's the not just a, a matter of playing on that. There are people who do feel that way. Well, yeah, um, but, and, uh, I mean, as far as A Hard Day's Night goes, I've watched the first you know, half hour of that so many times I can't count because I love the train scene. I think there, there's some brilliant acting. I mean, there's brilliant acting all through that movie, but the train scene is the, is really just something you can never get tired of because it's just so good. I can never get tired of any of that movie. Mm. Well, <laughs> true, but I yeah. mean, you know what I'm saying. Uh-huh. And then there's the train music, which... <laughs> Which actually, you you have an update on that that you uh, that you posted in Beatles Examiner. It, yeah, it, there's there it, signs are pointing, and I say signs because it hasn't been confirmed that Jimmy Page may be on that song, hmm. and that's definitely I mean, that's definitely strange. Um, I mean, it makes sense because it makes some sense because, of course, Page was a very active session musician, but. The idea that he played on that song is is and and we haven't heard that yet. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Well, it's definitely not the Beatles, though. It's apparently yeah. It's pretty much been dismissed that it's not that it's the Beatles. It's not the Beatles. Mm-hmm. But I mean, we've had some we've had some great we've had some interesting discussions. We haven't come to blows yet. Not yet. Uh, are are you expecting that? No. Well, no. <laughs> Unless we start talking about uh, Magical Mystery Tour again, but, we we can have different points of view. Or if I or, or if I say Paul Paul uh, one of Paul's albums is not significant, we might get we might get close. Uh no, this goes to show you don't know me well enough yet. Oh okay. Yeah. And After a hundred shows, I don't know you well enough yet. No. Oh okay. You don't. Most of the time, when you and I have talked about the Beatles, it's been on this show. So. You know, we could have had lots of conversations privately, and you don't know my feelings about a lot of things with the Beatles. No, that's true. So, that's and true. the Beatles, you're dealing with this enormous catalog, so many albums, so many songs, so much history. It's a million things to talk about. Right. So let's uh, close this show by talking about what has surprised you most about doing this show. Well, I guess the thing that surprised me the most was actually doing it, and not, you know, not just sitting here and, and, you know, talking every week, but, you know, the the uh, the ins and outs of, of having to, you know, watch what you say, you know, the technical, I mean, this is the first time, you know, and I, I'm probably not telling everybody something that I, you know, that's really a big surprise. I mean, this is the first time I've ever been on a regular radio show like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had done a podcast myself, by myself at one point, which is actually on iTunes and it's on archive.org, just as a test several years ago. And I, I just did the one and that was it. And I, I hadn't done another one. So this is really my first experience with doing a, a real radio show. Um, and it's been, I mean, it's it's been a learning experience. I'm still, uh, I wish we were not on opposite ends of the country. That's, one thing I don't particularly, uh, I wish was different. I echo those words. <laughs> but there's nothing we can do about that unless we both win the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think is going to happen, or maybe Paul McCartney sent us you know, a big check or something. I don't think that's going to happen either. Hmm. But. Well, the, the, what you just said about watching every word that we say, I don't think we do that. I think that we are critical on the show if we feel it needs to be, but we're critical with diplomacy. True. You know, and that's that's the way to get around it. I mean, if you take a look at some of the things that I've said, and I, I tend to be very positive, as 
more positive than most people when it comes to the Beatles, the group, and the solo uh, mm-hmm. uh, catalog and, and all the music. But, um, you know, there are moments when I am critical. Like when I talk about, I think that Paul's remasters don't have enough bonus material. Yeah, you were you were pretty um, you were pretty critical with that, and I was actually kind of surprised. Well, you agree with me. I did agree with you, and I, in fact, I think I agree with you more that that is definitely true, mm-hmm. uh, especially on these later on these new remasters. That there's, I mean, he does. There's a lot of printed material, but I think people would rather. I, you're all the audio stuff than the printed stuff. Yeah, but I will say I do love all the books and all the Linda photos. I think that adds oh, yeah. so much, definitely. And it makes her presence more felt and, and makes you realize how much more important she was in, in Paul's music and in his life. Right. So, But as far as I'm concerned, I will say that um, my biggest concern doing this show every single week wasn't being worried about there being news every week because God only knows the 50th anniversary... You couldn't possibly cover all the news <laughs> no, <laughs> on, on a been, weekly it's show. Been, it's been interesting trying to decide what not to talk about. Yeah, but there have been times when there's, there's always news every single week, but how much of it warrants doing a full show on or to talk for 30 minutes or more? Uh, you know, Sometimes there have been weeks when there's been a struggle there. And there's no way that you can cover every single book that's out there. It's just impossible. The well, thank, go- thank goodness that we've had, you know, all the books this year that we've had, or, uh, you know, because that's really helped. Uh, it's been nice having a lot of these people, and we'll have more of them in the future on the show. So, yeah, I mean, it's been great having some of these people that uh, are talking about their books and the book, you know, and the musicians, too. I mean, that's been a lot of fun. So. Hmm. But that was that was a main concern of mine, and the other big concern was that because this is a new show, I was concerned that these shows would become dated very quickly. But I'm learning, as I happen to look on Podbean, that people are discovering the show and listening to older shows. Right. And the reason why is because a lot of this stuff is not dated at all, especially if you talk to authors about their latest book. It doesn't matter whether the book came out a year ago or six months ago or today. It's still relevant. And the, and even the news story, even the news shows, the, you know, the shows that were pegged to a certain news event, that kind of discussion goes on endlessly on Facebook, on Twitter, and stuff. And so it's always there. There we go. But uh, I'm really pleased about that, that the fact that these shows, you know, have legs to them, and then it's not just the show of the moment. Right. So, uh, you know, people are finding that out and going back to older shows of ours as well as the new ones. Yep. So, uh, you know, that's the big learning experience for me in doing this. There is a challenge because there are weeks when there isn't much to talk about, to tell you the truth. And what do you do in those cases? And I remember, and I'm just telling you this, Steve, when Paul was ill and he canceled those the concerts in uh, Japan and South Korea, mm-hmm. how much can you say about that? You know, we're concerned. We hope he gets better. <laughs> you know, those kind of shows, how do you talk for 30 minutes about that? Those well, are the most difficult shows. Trying not to go off and, and do what was happening where people were guess, trying to guess what he, you know, what he had. And that just, you know, that just wasn't, uh, you know, with all the rumors of how sick he was and how ill he was. And, mm-hmm. You know, there were people that, there were rumors that he wasn't coming back and, stuff like that and it, you know obviously I'm, you know we're really glad that that's not the case but it's just crazy that, of with some of the stuff that went around at that point mhm ridiculous so all right so uh, if you would like to comment on this show or any of our shows and you'd like to write to us our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com and if you want to get in touch with me directly, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also look at my Facebook page under Ken Michaels. We have our own Facebook page under Things We Said Today. And I have my own website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And uh, people want to get in touch with you, Steve, they can do so how? They can write to me at beetlesexaminer at gmail.com. I've gotten actually several interesting notes this week. You can... Catch me on Facebook uh, on my own personal page. Um, there's a Beatles Examiner page. There's a Beatles News and Commentary group for all that I post news items in, and that 
uh, you can talk to me about news. Um, there's all, I'm all over the place on Facebook, but uh, and Twitter and Google Plus and all those places. So feel free, you know, say hi. Even you don't have to mention anything specific. You can just say hello and you know tell us you like the show. Okay. So uh, I would just like to personally thank you, Steve, for these 100 shows. And, you can uh, also. And thanks to all the guests, many of them, who have been on this program in the last, well, two years. And uh, especially all of our listeners who have been uh, with the show, whether you were there at the beginning or you're just catching on to us. So uh, thanks to all of you. This has been a lot of fun. Let me, let me echo that. Thank you, uh, and we hope you'll uh, continue to... Uh, Listen to us and spread the word and tell everybody about it and that uh, we're doing something, uh, you know, a lot of fun and, you know, really interesting. And and uh, so you can catch us uh, on uh, iTunes or you can catch us on Podbean, on Pod, uh, Podbean, beatlesexaminer.podbean.com. That's our website there. And also, we mustn't forget, thanks to Matt Burley at fab4radio.com for carrying the show every single week. Uh, yep. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, it's on uh, once on Saturday at noon ET and and uh, twice on Sunday at noon and noon and midnight. All right, this has been great. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels for things we said today, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thanks to uh, our listeners, and uh, we will see you for another hundred shows next time. Hopefully. Hopefully. (laughs)